Okay, um, I'm going to continue where, where Roy uh, left, and that is, uh, I want to talk about uh, one particular uh, source of uh, temperature change which uh, is neglected by the IPCC, and that is the effect that uh, the sun has. Um, can I have uh, the slide? You control your oh, I control it, wow. <laughs> okay, so uh, I want to uh, talk about the effect that the sun has. Um, because the sun has uh, increased its activity over the 20th century, it actually plays, uh, it has played a role in uh, part of the warming, in fact, uh, more than uh, half of it. So let's see uh, what we have. Okay, so uh, following uh, Roy, uh, I want to emphasize uh, the point that there are actually, there's actually no direct evidence that CO2 has uh, caused the warming. If you uh, sift through the IPCC reports, you'll realize that basically the two main arguments that have been used over the years to quote unquote prove that humans are the, uh, the, the source of the, the warming um, are two. One is that the warming is uh, unprecedented. There's, there has been nothing like that uh, in the past. Uh, we know from uh, the climate gate emails that uh, this is uh, simply incorrect. Uh, during the Middle Ages, it was uh, just as warm. And now that uh, I know what uh, uh, glaciers are receding in, uh, in the Alps, you suddenly see um, I don't know what, uh, Roman villages, uh, remnants of, of Roman villages. Obviously, the Romans were, I mean, they were very powerful, but they didn't cause any global warming. Um, and the other um, a quote unquote uh, argument that uh, the IPCC is using is that uh, if we exclude the effects of uh, CO2, then we cannot explain the warming. But as Roy, of course, uh, said, uh, the models were designed uh, in such a way to give you a uh, a large warming and to minimize the effect that, uh, that you have naturally. Okay, so um, these are the two main arguments and I want to emphasize that there is no single piece of evidence showing you that CO2 has a large effect on climate. Now, some of you might have seen Al Gore's uh, science fiction movie. Uh, in <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in that movie, uh, he has shown us uh, that graph, uh, which is the temperature and CO2 reconstruction based on ice core uh, measurements. Uh, at the bottom, you have the CO2, and at the top, you have uh, temperature reconstruction based on uh, oxygen or, or, or hydrogen uh, uh, isotope ratios, and he told us uh, uh, there's, a, there's a complicated relation, but obviously you see that when there's more CO2, the temperature is higher. What he didn't tell us is that in all cores where you have a high enough resolution, where you have a high enough resolution, you see that the uh, CO2 follows the temperature and not vice versa. Namely, we know that the CO2 is affected by the temperature, but it doesn't tell you anything about the opposite relation. In fact, there's no time scale whatsoever where you see CO2 variations cause a large temperature variations. Um, on geological time scales, as you see at the bottom right, you can reconstruct the CO2 on one hand. That's the top uh, graph. It's a logarithmic scale. Uh, for example, 450 million years ago, we had maybe 10 times as much CO2 in the atmosphere as we have uh, today. Uh, at the bottom, you see a temperature reconstruction and I, I don't think there is any correlation between these two graphs. And from the lack of correlation, you can actually place an upper limit on the effect of CO2 on the climate. And that upper limit is one and a half degree increase, degree Celsius increase, uh, when you double the amount of CO2. For comparison, the IPCC uh, range or canonical range is a one and a half to four and a half degree increase if you double the amount of CO2. Okay, so this is the IPCC range, and we know that the sensitivity has to be somewhere over here based on empirical evidence. Now, the really surprising thing is that this range of one and a half to four and a half degrees has been the canonical range set already by a federal committee that's convened in 1979. It is, I think, quite mind-boggling that after billions of dollars and billions of euros and Deutsches Mark and whatever was invested in uh, climate research, we don't know the answer to the question of what is climate sensitivity any better. It's, it's quite ridiculous. Uh, it would have been funny if it weren't sad. Okay, so we can actually uh, place an upper limit on the effect of uh, CO2, which is below the effect uh, that, uh, or below the range quoted by the IPCC. Okay, so uh, going back, um, again, the, the second argument is that there's nothing else to explain the warming, but in fact there is, and the thing is 
You just have to look up in the sky, you see the sun. The sun changes its activity. You have the 11-year solar cycle. Every 11 years, the uh, north and south magnetic poles of the sun switch polarity. Um, and that causes a range of changes that uh, we witness uh, here on Earth. There's a change in the amount of UV. There's a change in the strength of the solar wind. There's a change in the number of aurora we can see, and so forth. And it turns out that these variations translate into temperature variations here on Earth. How can we see that? We can see, for example, this is one of the nicest uh, examples I know of. At the bottom, you have uh, the temperature reconstruction based on uh, geochemical uh, measurements, uh, the ratio between oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. Oxygen 18 is heavier than oxygen 16, so it tells you, uh, so water with the oxygen 18 is heavier and it evaporates slower from the ocean, so this is basically a proxy, uh, in this case, uh, of the temperature in the Indian Ocean because it's uh, reconstructed from uh, stalagmites in a cave in Oman, which is a country in the Southern Arabian Peninsula. At the top, you see a carbon-14 uh, uh, to carbon-12 uh, isotope ratio. Um, carbon-14 is uh, radioactive, as uh, most of us know. Uh, it's produced by high energy particles called uh, cosmic rays, which uh, hit our Earth's atmosphere all the time, but uh, they come from outside the solar system, but when the sun is more active and it has a stronger uh, solar wind, less of these particles can reach the Earth and produce less uh, carbon-14. So basically what you see is a proxy of uh, solar activity. So I think, maybe I am wrong, that there is a correlation between the two graphs. Do you see a correlation? <laughs> Okay, so it can tell you two things. It can tell you that the sun is affecting the climate, and it could be that, the cli that Earth here is affecting the sun. Okay, uh, I'll let you choose. Okay, here is another example. Um, at the, you see here again uh, in blue the carbon-14 derived from uh, tree rings, um, and in black you see a marine sedimentation from the northern Atlantic. You look at a cores from the sea surface of the oceans, and basically what happens is that uh, when it's colder, you have a ice uh, floating further south, melting and leaving uh, the ice raft to debris at, uh, for, at further southerly latitudes, you know, like the Titanic in 1910, for example. Uh, it was actually colder that time, and that's why you had icebergs floating further south. Um, so you see a nice correlation, and it tells you that uh, there is a correlation between a climate in the northern Atlantic and solar activity. There's a climate between the Indian Ocean, uh, the, uh, and uh, there's a correlation between the climate in the Indian Ocean and, <clears throat> and solar activity and so forth. So we see that on uh, centen centenia centennial and millennial timescales, there is a clear correlation between climate on Earth and uh, solar activity. Uh, here is another example. This time it's on shorter time scale. Uh, you can see here in uh, red, uh, the dashed red line, that's uh, basically solar activity. And you can see that it oscillates every 11 years. Basically every 11 years, the north and south magnetic poles of the sun switch uh, polarity. So you see um, the solar uh, cycle. In blue, and then the, the gray area is the error on it, you see the... Um, the rate of change of the oceans, of the sea level, uh, the, the height of the sea, uh, the, the sea level. Um, basically, you obviously see a nice uh, correlation. You can use that to calculate the effect that the sun has on climate. On uh, short time scales, most of the change of the sea level is due to heat going into the oceans and uh, causing it to uh, thermally expand. Uh, on longer time scales, you have uh, melting of uh, ice sheets and so forth, but on short time scales, it's mostly, at least 80%, due to changes in the uh, heat content of the ocean. So basically, you have here a calorimeter with which you can quantify the effect that the sun has. Okay, so this is the trillion dollar graph. This is what I want you to remember from this uh, presentation today. This is a graph that quantifies the effect that the sun has on climate. And this effect is very large. How large? About an order of magnitude larger than what the IPCC is willing to admit the sun has. Okay, um, 
that was published uh, in, uh, sorry, th this was published in 2008, so it was before the cutoff date of the previous IPCC uh, report, but obviously um, it was ignored. Why? Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit hard to uh, reconcile it with the rest of the report. Uh, here you have a continu uh, a Another analysis uh, that uh, took place several years later with the satellite altimetry data. And you can see that uh, if you just use the sun and the uh, El Nino southern oscillation, you can explain the variations in the change of the sea level. Uh, what you see here is the sea level minus the linear trend, which is due to a melting of ice caps because there was some warming uh, on Earth. But be besides this linear trend, almost all the sea level change is explained because of the sun and the El Nino southern oscillation. Okay, so it continues to show exactly the same signal we expect. Okay, so uh, what you see here is basically an estimate of the change in the radiative budget that Earth has witnessed over solar cycles. Uh, you see, you've seen the tide gauge record uh, graph and the satellite atrimetry, but you can use three additional uh, data sets uh, which show you exactly the same thing, that there has been a large amount of heat going into the ocean every solar cycle. Um, at the bottom right, you see changes in the total solar irradiance, which is what the sun, sorry, not the sun, which is what the IPCC uh, says is the effect uh, of the sun. But obviously there's a discrepancy. Um, it tells you that there must be some kind of an amplification mechanism, which uh, again, the, the climate community as a whole is, uh, is ignoring. Now, what does that imply to the picture over, uh, of 20th century climate change? Um, what you see here is the uh, changes in the uh, uh, radiative forcing caused by different uh, elements uh, in the atmosphere. At the top you have uh, greenhouse gases, um, and then uh, you have other things such as uh, aerosols uh, affecting the clouds, uh, direct and indirect effect, and so forth. At the bottom, the last, the, the, main, the, the very small bar you can barely see at the bottom, that is the effect that the IPCC claims is due to solar activity. However, we know that solar activity increased over the 20th century, and now using the oceans, we can quantify and see how large the solar effect should have been. And it is this large. Okay, so basically the IPCC models have, it, have a, a huge ingredient missing from the analysis and therefore um, what the, the, in, in computers you call it uh, this kind of, uh, of a, a algorithm is called uh, GIGO. It's uh, garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so what does that tell us about uh, 20th century warming? So um, basically the, the models are trying to uh, fit the 20th century are trying to explain a warming of about, say, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 degrees over the 20th century. Uh, we know what the anthropogenic forcings uh, were, at least to, to some extent. Um, and then in order to explain this kind of warming, you need a high climate sensitivity, which is why all those models basically have uh, the sensitivity tuned to be high in order to explain what has happening uh, over the 20th century. And then when you integrate them forward in time, for example, over the 21st century, you get a large temperature increase, much larger than is observed, as Roy has showed you uh, before. Okay, however, we know that a, the net positive forcing over the 20th century has been much larger because the sun has increased its activity, and if the sun has increased its activity, uh, we have to take it into account. The larger net radiative forcing now implies that if you want to fit the 20th century warming, you need a climate sensitivity which is much lower. How much? Around one to one and a half degree increase per CO2 dubbing. This is consistent with uh, what we measured, for example, from geological timescales. It's consistent with what uh, uh, Dick Lindzen has been advocating based on, say, uh, uh, is he here? Uh, based on, uh, on uh, volcanic activity and so forth. We have empirical evidence showing that the climate sensitivity has to be on the low side, but again, it's uh, ignored. 
Um, okay, so we can, you know, we can uh, build a model, uh, take uh, the model that uh, Linzen has done, and try to fit the 20th century. And when we use a model which includes solar activity increase, which was not monotonic, for example, over the, uh, uh, between 1940 and 1960, uh, or 1970, solar activity actually decreased, and when we include that, uh, we actually find that we can explain temperature variations over the 20th century with a residual which is much smaller than what standard climate models can uh, give you. Why? Because, again, we take the sun into account and we allow uh, for a low climate sensitivity, one which is consistent with the empirical observations. Okay, so this is, now we can integrate forward in time, for example, for a vanilla-flavored uh, scenario, um, and make many realizations, and this is for comparison what the IPCC is predicting. Okay, so what we find is that once you include the sun, uh, you get a, that you can fit the data much better, uh, the climate sensitivity is much lower, and our predictions for future warming are much more benign. Okay, now, uh, in principle, I could have stopped uh, here, uh, but you can ask the question, hey, just a second, there is some kind of an amplification mechanism. What is it? Now, in reality, if you write the IPCC reports, you don't have to know what this uh, amplification mechanism is because we see that the sun has a large effect. We know we have to take that into account. However, as uh, intelligent, uh, curious creatures, we want to know where this correlation uh, or where this amplification mechanism comes from. And, um, and it turns out that uh, it's also relevant because in debates, uh, the alarmist community is saying, oh, we cannot take this effect into account because uh, if we don't understand how it uh, comes about, then obviously it must be wrong. Okay, so, it, so the, the thing is that we now know exactly where this effect comes from, uh, and that's the subject of, uh, of one of the things I work on. It turns out that uh, it's actually related to those cosmic rays I mentioned before, which produce the carbon-14. Not only are they a proxy of solar activity, they're actually the link that links between solar activity and climate on Earth. Uh, these cosmic rays are produced by supernova remnants. These are massive stars that die uh, in our vicinity. The cosmic rays diffuse in the Milky Way. They reach the solar system. They penetrate the solar system. They reach uh, the Earth. They uh, hit the atmosphere, and the secondary particles produced by the cosmic rays can shower uh, all the way down to the bottom part of the troposphere, and they are the dominant source of ions in the atmosphere. Okay, here we might have a, a radon gas emanating from uh, the concrete, uh, but uh, in the rest of the troposphere, it's basically cosmic rays. Today, we know that these cosmic rays uh, are uh, producing uh, condensation nuclei. These are small particles, uh, a few uh, nanometers uh, in diameter in size. Um, and those, um, those uh, 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 ions, are also, they also increase the uh, survival uh, of those aerosols as they grow to become the cloud condensation nuclei, the surfaces upon which you can condense water vapor when you want to form uh, clouds. Um, and we know that when we play with the number density of cloud uh, droplets, when we form clouds, we change the, the, the whiteness, the albedo of uh, the clouds. And with that, we can play with the energy budget of Earth. So we can see that empirically taking place. <clears throat> what you see here are called uh, Forbush decreases. You can have a gust in the solar winds, um, and as a consequence, you get a reduction. You see that in the red lines, a reduction in the flux of cosmic rays reaching the Earth. Um, and then here you see um, an aerosol data set, and then uh, three different cloud data sets showing you how the clouds react to this reduction in the cosmic ray flux. So we can see how cosmic rays affect, um, affect the uh, cloud cover. Um, we can also go to and an, an carry an experiment. This is what happens when a theoretician enters the lab. Um, and we can actually mimic the conditions that you find, for example, over the oceans, play with the, the ionization in the chamber and see all these mechanisms uh, taking place. And we can see how ions uh, increase the condensation of, uh, of small aerosols, uh, an experiment which was then uh, repeated at CERN. And we can see also two different mechanisms which increase uh, the survivability of the small aerosols to become large aerosols. 
Um, so it, one was already published, uh, the other one is going to be published. The only thing missing is to take this mechanism, plug them into a global aerosol model, and then see what the global effect is. And this is research which is on its uh, ongoing research which should be published this year. Uh, on long time scales, and with this, uh, almost, and with this I'll almost end, uh, there are huge variations in the cosmic ray flux due to the fact that we pass through spiral arms of uh, the galaxy. It turns out you can use iron meteorites to see how the cosmic ray flux has uh, changed. Um, and every so often, every about 145 million years, we pass through a region where there's much more star formation and acceleration of cosmic rays uh, uh, around us. And you can, uh, using the uh, geochemical uh, analysis uh, in the uh, in uh, fossils, uh, you see here at, at the bottom graph so of the top panel, you see a temperature uh, reconstruction on one hand, uh, and you can compare that to the cosmic ray flux reconstruction based on uh, iron meteorites, and you see that uh, cosmic rays affected the climate over the past uh, billion years. Um, so let me summarize. Uh, there is no argument that um, uh, proving that uh, global warming is uh, mostly uh, human. The um, actual evidence points to a very strong uh, solar climate uh, link. Once we take this link into account, we can understand what has been happening much better uh, with a residual which is much smaller, and it's consistent with a climate sensitivity which is on the low side, which means that any future warming because of human activity is going to be relatively small. And with this, I'll end. Thank you.